I get to introduce my man, Mike. So uh, Mike Mendez is the um, one of the chief developers of I2B2 for the past 12 years. And um, much of what he does now is this and uh, work in various uh, places to enable them to be using I2B2. And he's going to present one of those. Is Mary? So Mary. Yes. <laughs> from, uh, so Mary's from uh, Puerto Rico. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the uh, places that we've been focusing on is Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. There's something called the uh, Network, mm -hmm. which is uh, serves um, a population tend to be underrepresented and therefore um, being able to make sure that they get represented in nationwide projects um, is one of the key issues that we all face. And uh, thank you. We're going to take a look at how this is happening. Thank you. Uh, Mary. Thank you. Uh, Sean was talking about how following everyone with these great presentations today was sort of an, uh, an honoring situation for him. For me, I get to do that in a function. So, <laughs> so what I like is setting up, um, thank you all. Today, you've heard wonderful things about I do be through, I do be transport, how these products, these innovations are being used to really move forward in so many capacities. Um, our ability to take <coughs> vast arrays of data, patient data from EHRs, from genomic data. I'm just, I'm, I, I, when the question was asked earlier about how many people are there were, I was one of the five. So I sort of spent a little bit in awe of what all of you. Um, I have the pleasure of serving as director of the Environmental Development Board at the Puerto Rico Medical Consortium. UPR, the Medical Science Coordinator, is an institution. When I took over the core uh, five years ago, my goal was to build the core in a way so that. Um, PRC PRC would have a true representation. Part of that was to bring on board I2B2. Um, we began to work with Mike through uh, the RCMI Archer Network, uh, which our institution, Morehouse and Harry Howard University in particular, uh, were all at different levels of implementation, bringing in I2B2. And as most of you all know, uh, Puerto Rico in 2017 was slam danced with two hurricanes. On August the uh, 21st, Irma took a shot at us, uh, crossed over the northern side of the island, maybe 100 miles off the coast, wasn't a direct hit, but we had a lot of wind, a lot of rain. Took out the power grid to a great extent, what have you. On September the 20th, however, we weren't so lucky. Hurricane Maria did a dead landfall. And I think at the time she made landfall, she was at a category four uh, level. Although before she hit us, it was at a category five. So I think we're good to go. Hopefully, put this here. I know. Okay. Being a non tech person, I'm, I, I bow to the master. <laughs> George, I should have had this up quickly, but no, sorry. Okay. Um, oh, that's a long slide. My background in a previous life was working with community health preparedness with a health department in El Paso, Texas, which basically meant we were the people who were the biomed. Um, the bioterrorism group 
doing community disaster planning. And when Emma hit, particularly Maria hit, um, I was sitting in my office just sort of devastated by, by what had happened to us. Let's see if I can move this a little bit. And had really just finished a phone conversation with a dear friend who had just finished telling me about how she alone had lost five close friends. Not because they got killed during the hurricane, but because they died because either they didn't have their medications and were isolated in the aftermath of the hurricane, that they uh, were found too late, they had chronic conditions, severe conditions, were airlifted to the mainland for treatment, but either died en route or soon thereafter because they had been without the treatment for a long time. And that was one individual who had lost five people. And this friend is in the same age cohort that I am in. Um, so this slide basically says, you know, the official death toll at within Puerto Rico, the Commonwealth, last count was estimated at 64. The Harvard, Harvard University released a study released the last couple of weeks that estimated the death toll at being around 6,400 people. That's been debated. But the reality is we really don't know how many people died, either directly during the hurricane, but mostly in the aftermath because they were isolated, didn't have access to medication, didn't have access to ongoing support like oxygen, things of this nature, many, many different complications. And as I sat there looking at what we had done with ITV2 and everything that um, my friend and I talked about in reflecting on my past life in emergency planning, Again, in a conversation with Mike, who we've been working with for a while, I said, isn't there something we can do with I2B2 in a preparatory mode? We're doing wonderful things with it in terms of science looking forward. How can we use this tool to, to really reach out and um, help prepare in the case of natural disaster? So he and I, and basically Mike, when I asked him the question, he went, well, let me think about it. And about an hour later, he said, yeah, <laughs> we can do this. So we have put together a prototype called InvaCheck, which is Identifying Natural Disaster Vulnerabilities Checklist. And the idea is that with InvaCheck, we were looking at ways that we could use the tool I2V2 as a resource in innovative ways that helped us look at the available big data that we have coming from our EHR uh, ETL system. So that everything that we needed to make this product operational was already in our clinical data repository. Leveraging the anatomy of I2V2 and the fact that it's an open source software, it is, it is structured on um, ontologies that are, are sound, well-developed, you know, accepted the whole bit, so that um, as we, again, have our look at our different hospitals that have input into our ITB2 system, those ontologies enable us to have a uniform way of, of searching the data. And again, it's to leverage what we had available in terms of other open source software that Mike could use to bring in different features that were essential for healthcare emergency personnel and first responders to use this system in the field as we had intended it to. So the, the goals that we had were to uh, look at the architecture map of the InvaCheck application and in that um, we were going to bring in data from the ITB2 system, again, leveraging um, open source software tools. ITB2 has the ETL process. We're going to leverage that as part of InvaCheck and also within this to be able to create a computer interface and an application portal 
And that application portal, we uh, again constructed it with the idea that it would be used by hospital emergency personnel and first responders in the field. Thanks, Mary. So, um, so the architecture around it, uh, as you can see, is going to have uh, everything. Most of the system is going to be in your HIPAA compliance. So, utilizing outside resources, it's mainly everything is in, internal. So, the InvoCheck application server. Uh, this is always there. So, this is the main application server. This. Uh, it's a web-based web application. It's going to connect up to multiple different databases. One is going to be the OpenStreet server. So this is similar to uh, the, the street maps that you have with Google, but OpenStreets is a publicly available one. And we can actually host the whole application internally, so we're not releasing any type of addresses to Google, which would be a violation of any type of HIPAA. So everything, like I said, is going to stay internal. The Open EMPI is an enterprise management. Um, the Open EMPI is uh, what it stands for, uh, Enterprise Master Patient Index. And that is what's going to have um, the connection to the patients, uh, the, the full names, the addresses, uh, cell numbers. Uh, and that information is loaded <laughs> from the data warehouse. And so, the, and a, so the uh, InvoCheck Data Warehouse and ETL is the system that would extract the data from the EHR systems and get it ready for the uh, InvoCheck system. So to give an idea of the portal, so you would begin by creating a patient cohort. And so in that patient cohort, um, you first begin with any type of demographic information you want. For example, maybe you want to just do a uh, anyone who has chronic kidney disease that speaks Spanish so that you can deal with, and then uh, the first responders who was familiar with Spanish would deal with that cohort of groups. After, uh, so you can also specify a date range within that. Um, the next, uh, the next uh, with part of the wizard is selecting the, uh, the ICD-9 uh, CPT code for the procedures or diagnosis that you're interested in. And then the final one is any type of, say, medications. So the, uh, the medications, uh, if there was a complete power outage and the refrigerators are down, and then uh, the medication the patient were taking needed to be in the refrigerator, then you could do a query based on uh, medications that are at that type of risk. So that so once you've created the patient cohort, the next uh, the next screen is. Uh, looking at the patient cohorts, and we have a demo which you can demo this. But basically, what it is is uh, these are a list of the patients. Uh, I also want to note that this is not real patient data. This is all fake uh, data. Um, so it gives you a screen of all the the locations of all the patients, and it color coordinates it based on the machine learning uh, to try to coordinate groups of uh, first responders with um, locations of locations of the of the responders, and so then there's also a breakdown of the different uh, groups that it had done. Um, this is uh, the a mo the mobile app, which would demonstrate how the first responder or the driver, whoever is uh, delivering the medicine or responding to something, would um, would see. Uh, so. As we mentioned, we're extending the ETL system. So in order for us to make it so that it would be easy for people to load their data into the InvoCheck machine, we broke down the ETL into four sections. Uh, one was the loading zone. And in the loading zone, it would be basically a one-to-one -one relation to your current EHR system. So if you had a patient's table which had a F name and then L name, we'd have the exact same table in our system, patient with L name and F name. So it's a complete one-to-one -one relation. And then also in the loading zone, we then would, uh, so the only work that you'd have to do is map these tables to a standardized uh, table structure. Once that standardized table structure is uh, 
the map, you just run through the rest of the zones. Because the rest of the zones are going to be based on that standardized format. So, for example, if that if in our standardized zone we said patient uh, first name and then patient last name, all you'd have to do is map your F name to full name, first, first name, and then L name to last name. So, and so that would be the loading zone. The working zone is uh, it's an optional zone. So what this would be is if your IRV requires that you have everything de-identified and no relation back, this is where the working zone would then strip the MRN, create a patient mapping table, put, uh, put in an identifier for that patient to that real MRN, and then load that data into like the identity management cell, which would then um, the InvoCheck would then use that to extract the uh, PHI information, which is which would be needed. Uh, the next zone is the data zone. This would be uh, taking uh, the data from the working zone and then actually loading it into the star schemas. And so, and then the very last one is the ontology zone. And so, depending on the center which ontologies you are interested in, you would. Uh, have the mapping of the ontologies and any type of other mappings that are not done. But typically, uh, it would just be the standard ICD-9 or CPT or SNOMED ontologies. And so this is just a quick uh, UI of the possible uh, loading the ontologies. And this is actually Microsoft SSIS, uh, which I've used a lot is very robust and loading massive amounts of data. And so. And again, this just looks at the um, some part of the architecture, looking at the ontologies, uh, ICD uh, codes, and the uh, low ink codes are all in multiple languages. So um, this gives, in terms of the Role in Puerto Rico, what we're finding is that all of um, the information that is loaded into the EHR systems are in English. But because it's in multiple languages, um, this application could potentially be, you know, put into any geographical area. The first um, one that you have shows the the interface in Spanish, then in Japanese, and then you have it in French. So it can be uh, implemented, it's transportable across uh, languages. Um, where we go from here? Again, in, for Puerto Rico, this particular type of an application has um, potential because our emergency management system has nothing. <laughs> we, I, and when I say nothing, I mean we're when Maria hit um, again with my background in emergency preparedness. It's like they got to. I felt like they got to the ten yard line and everybody just sort of lost their mind. They went back and asked people in the Department of Health and emergency departments. They universally kind of said, "Well, yeah, we all we have plans." But the level of the disaster was so much that everybody became overwhelmed and just sort of threw away the plan. They didn't, they just said, well, okay, we're gonna wing it. And I just kind of went, no, <laughs> but that's what they did. Um, but from the hospital perspective and talking to our emergency department directors, um, they in particular have a great level of concern, particularly for those patients that they know are frequent users of their facilities with chronic diseases that represent high utilization, high cost to the hospitals and the ability to have been able to identify them um, in a very specific manner to have been able to deploy teams to go check on people to make sure they would be able to um, <laughs> shelter in place safely have the necessary medications on hand to last for a week, two weeks, three weeks, oxygen, be able to make plans to uh, 
extract those who are not going to likely be able to handle any level of separation would have, we believe, helped reduce the number of deaths in the island, or at least hopefully not have contributed to worsening the clinical cases of many people. NIH did release a, a FOA um, in April. It was a rapid turnaround, uh, looking at, it was a time-sensitive research in health risk and resilience after hurricanes Irma and Maria. Looking at uh, study concepts for Puerto Rico and the U.S. Uh, Virgin Islands. We submitted to that. We, along with, I think, maybe around 700 other applicants, <laughs> we were not scored. They have not yet made the announcement as far as they know on that. But we have a lot of support from our emergency department folks. And so right now, we've gotten uh, feedback from the program officer at NIH with uh, two additional funding opportunities that we're going to pursue with this. We're also working to get before the director of our emergency management department, as well as our department of health secretary. We had letters of support from those folks when we submitted the application, but we're wanting to get FaceTime with them to actually now that we have a demonstrable model um, to see if we can get a nickel out of the 10 cents that they have. Um, and that's not an exaggeration in Puerto Rico. Um, and we're also developing a white paper that we'll be sharing with um, different organizations and entities um, right now, we've gotten leads from the Department of Defense, um, and we're trying to find a, a contact within FEMA to see if maybe there's someone within that organization that will listen to us. So, and if anybody has any ideas or potential funding opportunities, please let us know. So again, this is really, we were looking at a way to use I2V2 really in a very different way than what we've talked about all day long. Um, this is looking at it as a way to, for community response and for healthcare uh, preparedness. And I'm gonna turn it back to Mike for a demonstration. Okay, so we get, we're going to log in, admin, admin, like that. Okay, so no, don't see. So as an administrator, you would see some type of statistical analysis about the system, how it's doing, queries out of the run, queries that failed. Uh, any type of uh, statistical analysis that we do it. That was interesting. Uh, so we'll begin by creating a patient cohort. And it was going a lot quicker earlier. <laughs> Yeah, I realize. Uh, oh shoot, hold on a second. Damn it, kill my boot camp. Guess this is why you don't do live demos. <laughs> um, 
Let me check. <laughs> Okay, so Chrome seems to be a little bit uh, cleaner for some reason. So we're going to uh, name the query. So uh, chronic kidney disease, and I'll call that KCD. Because um, we're in the uh, patient population, uh, we, it was, uh, we're going to query based on some type of population. So we can do uh, like Asian if you want, or you could do males uh, for this we're just going to leave it blank we're just going to say any patient population so the next is uh, the diagnosis of procedures so if you know that icd9 n18 see, n18 is uh, chronic kidney disease we can select that and so now we're interested in all the patients who have chronic kidney disease and so this is the medications and labs that we could uh, select, but in this case, we're just going to leave it with that chronic kidney disease. We're going to finish it, and we notice we get a query that resulted in 206 patients in less than five milliseconds. Uh, so after the query is done, it would be then placed in a patient cohort section. And so we select our chronic kidney disease. And so this is using that open street maps. And so as you can see, um, we would group uh, patients based on locations. And so as you can see, there's like a main artery road here. So if there was a handful of patients on this uh, on the seacoast that uh, was outside of the main San Juan, then they would all be grouped in the same color coordination. Also on the legend, it, represents who the drivers are or the first responders for this, this, this group of patients. So if we start to zoom in to the um, San Juan area, we notice that we would have uh, um, cars that represent the drivers or the first responders and you can click on it and then get the name of the person and you can see exactly the location they're at. Uh, and so also, as you can see, if you type in notes and that would be sent to, directly to the, uh, to the responder or the driver, and so that they can get updated information. And then it has uh, full name, address, demographic information that you can send, and then the telephone numbers and some <laughs> items. And so this is like Mary said, this is a prototype demonstration. The only other thing I wanted to demonstrate was uh, localization aspect of it. Uh, hold on. So now it's switched into the Spanish version. And so we go back to just the patient cohort section. Uh, if we do a new query to reload it. As you can tell, the whole system has been localized in Spanish. Um, if we go to our next screen and we type in uh, ICD-10 and 18, you can see that the whole ontology is also localized in that Spanish language. So it's not just the application, it's the complete ontology. And so, so, so that's what we want to uh, we had a question of who was involved in the health system. Right. So we had uh, our first mission was hopefully. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, so our first mission was to try to get funding, which we didn't. And then we did create this prototype. Uh, we actually have thought about how to deal with uh, because Puerto Rico had a complete 100% power outage. It wasn't 99. There was no one who had power on the island. So as a result, the cell systems were completely down. Uh, so we actually decided to investigate using like shortwave radios and ham radios and other uh, 
type of amateur radio uh, technologies in order to do some type of response. Um, it's changed in the last 20 years or 30 years um, that they have the, the packet radio, the TCP over ham. There's lots of ways that you can actually uh, tether your laptop or your phone to a ham radio so that you actually do have full functionality. You can see on the app because it's tethered to uh, the packet over TCP so that you have full communication back over over the uh, over the over the air basically. So any other questions? Oh yeah I was just wondering if you have any uh, plan any functionality for responders themselves and kind of like keep track of who they've seen or give notes back. Uh, yes, that was actually that's a very excellent question that I completely forgot to talk about. And that if you looked in this slide, there was I love this. Uh, there was one section in there, and so in the very top you have the LAN. That's your local area network at your institution. In the middle is called the DMZ, the Demilitarized Zone. And then there's a server called the RPA, which is called the Response Pinger Rack. And so that is what the driver or first responder would be connecting to. And then the RPA would then send back to our to the Invercheck system. And likewise, it would send. If uh, they added a note and they knew that this driver was associated to it, the RPA would then send that information to that driver. That's an excellent question. Uh, so to build the prototype, uh, a couple weekends, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I had an idea of what the system was going to be, so I was, and then I was familiar with some of the the PHP stuff. So it was basically a couple weekends. Um, last weekend was a heavy weekend. <laughs> Not gonna lie. Uh, but I mean, ideally, my vision was to have an actual working that would actually send the queries to ITP to and come back. Um, that I realized wasn't gonna happen. Uh, I'm hoping uh, within the next couple of months, at least having that functionality working. Um, but, but now that we have the base structure of it, like the UI, now it's just trying to like replace the the components, like the, the text areas with the real data. So instead of it just showing up like a spreadsheet of patients, it's really going to query and get a PDO back and then plop that in there. Yeah, first thing yeah. Uh, I mean, we had. Um... We had actually included in the budget. Um, oh, you want to speak? Well, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had included in the development budget uh, a full-time programmer to work on this particular project exclusively. One year. One year. And again, that was structured because we were working with a grant uh, that had a two-year funding window. So, right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. You work in Puerto Rico, you learn to make the dollar stretch. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I don't have a question, just a comment. I yeah. want to thank you for an excellent presentation. Oh, yeah. And the great demo. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say how much I appreciate your work and Financial angels, I'm happy to give my name and contact information and send them our way. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.